tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. Hey, why are you looking at me like that? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah sorry about last week. A little administrative error down at the township, that's all. These things happen. What do you mean Jeff didn't feed you? He told me he did. Oh, dessert. Well, hell, Chester, I didn't get any dessert last Friday either. Quit your bitching. Spoiled kid. Well, come on in. Let's get back to business. Mmm. Ah, oh, freedom. They don't let you have these in... Uh, anyway, smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, y'all. Cause old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. Two tales. Eric Peabody here, reminding you that if you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. And while you're at it, check out Horror Hill on this very same network, where I'll bring you even more tales to terrify every week. Thanks, Drew and Chester. Let's do lunch. Our first story tonight is a weird one. And who better for a weird experience than our old pal Mario E. Martinez? You can find plenty of him on past episodes of this podcast. And if you haven't yet, I recommend it. So without further delay, I give you from author Mario E. Martinez. We sell pickles. One. Fritz swept dust into a plastic dustpan and threw it into a waiting trash can. But even old and at a distance, Peepaw saw the line of dirt left over. Fritz was agitated and it made the boy sweep absolutely for shit. Not that the shop had to look all that neat. People didn't come for the cement floors or the whitewashed walls, but for his famed pickles. They drove hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles, and handed over wads of cash for jars of the stuff. Uh, Fritz! Uh, go ahead and sweep that again, he said from his leaning spot in the corner. Peepaw himself resembled the pickles he sold. He was a short man of few dimensions and had a distinct bump on the side of his nose. Uh, and thinking on it, after... Go straighten out those jars over there. Yeah. Line up those labels uniform-like, like I tell ye. Fritz threw his head back, his shoulders dropping as though the broom and dustpan suddenly weighed a tremendous amount. He gave a pained look to the clock on the wall. Yeah, not the clock, the elder said, pointing. The spot where you just were. Yeah. Peepaw, Fritz complained. It's two minutes to five. Let's just lock up. Yeah, I wasn't aware I was keeping you from something, Peepaw said. Got somewhere to be? Uh, well... Hey, remember, I'm the one doing your mom the favor, he told Fritz. Yeah, she doesn't want you snorting this or smoking that. It's not like I need someone to sweep the floors like crap. Yeah, I did that fine before. It's just... I told Alexandra I'd meet her after work, Fritz confessed. She's gonna wait for me on the bench outside the candy shop. I promised I'd bring a jar of spicy garlic. Stay away from that girl, the elder snapped. Careful. It's the pickles she wants. <laughs> And not the one you're trying to give. Fritz's face dropped. Not everyone's after our pickles. My pickles! 
And yes, they are. No, Peepa, they're... A 200-year-old recipe. Yeah. And you don't think everyone's after these pickles. <laughs> it's all they talk to me about. Fritz groaned. That's because you never leave the store. The elder grinned. Yeah, you got me there. <laughs> we close when we close. So get sweeping. Two. Councilman Taylor had no idea how many cigarettes or bottle of cola he had had. He had hardly moved from his bench for hours. He watched a pickle shop with a quiet disdain. We Sell Pickles was written on the lone sign in the window, and to Taylor's annoyance, the county record showed the shop was registered as simply Pickles. During his stakeout, he counted over a hundred people going in with money and coming out with armfuls of pickle jars. Thinking of all that money really bothered the councilman. Taylor, as head of Dodd's Chamber of Commerce, looked at their little downtown as a point of pride. Dodd itself was an agriculture town dominated by a big slaughterhouse, so the old-time architecture and painted block of storefronts on Main was a bit of refinement. Except for the eyesore, we sell pickles. Unlike the other shops, we sell pickles bore no decorations. Even during Christmas or Easter, when all of downtown gussied themselves up with bunting and ribbons and window paint. Even worse, the store sat near one of the first corners of downtown, so that the diminutive and creatively compliant Cheryl's Honey Hoss was dwarfed by the big windows and uniform rows of pickles, onions, okra, jalapenos, and anything that could be pickled, all beneath a paper sign declaring, We Sell Pickles in thick black letters. Sure, We Sell Pickles may have only turned away a handful of people a week, but Dodd could use every penny after the bad press because of those silly murders. On the sly, offers were made to replace We Sell Pickles. Everything from cafes, antique shops, a locally sourced wine room, and two leather companies offered to have Peepaw Pickles' legs broken to move a deal along. Yet dislodging We Sell Pickles, Taylor found, was nearly impossible. Not only did the old pickle man pay his rent on time in full, he did so months in advance. Of all the shop owners, he alone never complained about the county appraisal that raised their rent. And even worse, people loved those pickles. Everyone Taylor saw go into the shop came out carrying jars and smiling. They came from all over, too. Taylor took special notice of the out-of-state plates, and the further the state, the more they'd park on the street, walk right past the other shops and their nice displays to go right into We Sell Pickles. These out-of-towners usually left with a lot of sloshing pickle jars, and expressions that reminded Taylor of an uncle of his who used to huff antifreeze. Some pickle eaters even drove off with a pickle sticking out from between their teeth like cigars. Smoking, Taylor went over his plan. Past closing, he'd break into We Sell Pickles. Surely there'd be something he could find, a violation or evidence of a crime, to finally be rid of the pickle store. Often he'd seen Peepaw Pickle spit his chew on the street, and Taylor was certain he probably did so around the pickles. It was good for Taylor that Peepaw Pickles was as rigid with his schedule as he was with his lack of community participation. Three. Councilman Taylor wasn't sure how so much grass could grow between buildings when the alleys hardly got any light, but as the sun set, he found himself in thigh-high grass behind the strip of downtown stores. He was sure there was nothing in the grass but some mosquitoes and ticks that fed on rats. Taylor waited until the last few minutes of light before prying open the We Sell Pickle service door with a small crowbar. The door made a loud, painful sound. Taylor waited a few moments to see if anyone heard, before slipping into the building. He entered the service space meant for electricians and plumbers to do their routine checks away from any customers or tourists. Those spaces doubled as emergency exits for shopkeeps who might be in the back of their shops during a fire or some other emergency. 
Taylor knew enough to disconnect the fire door so he wouldn't set off the alarm. If it went off, the county fire department would swarm in mass because the fire department often had very little to do around Dodd. The back room was long, wide, with barrels of cucumbers and okra and peppers lined up against the walls. A big work table in the middle was stained from the splashes of pickle juice and vegetable debris. The vinegar smell made Taylor dizzy. After he got his camera ready, he ran his finger across the surface of the table. A dirty finger and a clean line across the grime would be great, Taylor thought. Yet there was nothing there. Not so much as a smudge of residue. The table he was shocked to find wasn't even sticky. The jars, Taylor prayed, had to be dirty, but like the table, they gleamed pristine in the camera flash. Not a single one even photographed Cloudy. Next were the barrels, but for those, Taylor planned to snot into them and scratch his head until the surface got a light dusting of gray and hair. Yet he hadn't anticipated the smell. He had almost gotten used to the vinegar smell seeping from the hundreds of pickle jars, but opening a barrel, Taylor made the mistake of inhaling deeply. The garlic and vinegar and capers singed the inside of his nose, clinging to the sensitive flesh. He coughed until his eyes watered, crashing through the place. The only thing to bring him out of it was a doorknob jamming him painfully in the hip. He hissed, ingesting more sharp pickle there and used his tie to cover his nose and mouth. Catching his breath, Taylor saw a door nearly hidden in the dim depths of the room. It bore a paper sign that read, No Entry, Especially You, Fritz. Taylor's imagination ran with all the possibilities of what lay behind the door. A hidden trash pile, a stash of at-home bug spray stored in a non-government approved way, Maybe a whole stack of crates filled with rotten cucumbers that Peepaw Pickles sowed to save money. Whatever was behind the door, there were possibilities, while in the current room there was just pristine frustration. The door was locked, but the door frame was so warped that the latch was exposed. Taylor used his councilman's ID to open it. There was no trash, no fetid crates. Instead, there was a narrow staircase going down into darkness. Taylor was stunned. There were no basements on that block, least of all any that looked to stretch below the neighboring stores. Phone lightened away, Taylor descended the steps. The old planks dipped beneath his weight. The stairs ended almost 15 feet below the street level and emptied into a hall of brick, its floor plain cement. To his right, the hall dead ended at a set of heavy wooden shelves laden with cloudy pickle jars. To his left, the hall stretched another 15 feet or so, ending with a wooden door. Iron bands kept the planks together. The door looked almost as old as the town. Light glinted between the slats of the door. The door was unlocked. 4. The door revealed a gigantic glass vat of pickle juice braced with iron reinforcements of an ancient make. Vegetable scraps and spices swirled slow in the sickly yellow-green solution. The walls surrounding the vat were covered in framed pictures and articles about we sell pickles. Among them as well was an outdated pinup calendar. Taylor looked at the vat and imagined Peepaw Pickle filling it with pre-measured ingredients so it might taste good enough to blight downtown Dodd for another decade. Taylor smiled, thinking if the pickle man went to such effort to conceal the vat, it must be his most precious secret. Yes, there were plenty of vendors who'd love to know Peepaw Pickle's recipes. Taylor imagined that with some well-groomed competition, we sell pickles might be outclassed into closing. Taylor looked around for something to collect the pickle juice, but there was nothing but a filthy bucket, and if anyone was to mimic the pickle brine, the sample had to be clean. Out in the hall, he found a dusty jar. The pop of its unsealing was like a gunshot. Shaking his furrowed nose at the closed stink in the jar, Taylor blew into it, sending a nimbus of dust into his own face. 
Back at the vat, he looked for some kind of spigot or valve on it, but couldn't find one. Exhausting all options on the ground, Taylor looked up at the vat's heavy lid. Sighing, he reminded himself that a little trouble now would grant Dodd a future without we sell pickles, and when Taylor, an old man, would look at Dodd's beautiful quaint downtown on some distant holiday, there'd be solid blocks of festive decorations and shopkeeps that understood the value of a cohesive community. Dreaming of some distant Christmas, Taylor went and found a stepladder to get him up to the lid. Once there, Taylor found the lid and its wheel latch were in good working order, oiled and dusted. Taylor couldn't think of a place to put the jar, so he stuck it between his thighs and tried opening the lid. The wheel groaned with each turn, and finally, the lid shook from release. The lid was heavy, and when Taylor pushed it open, the stepladder clattered on its legs. The lid swung up on its hinges, landed with a resounding crash that nearly knocked Taylor off the stepladder. Balance regained, he checked the glass sides for cracks. Seeing no leaks, Taylor steadied himself. One jar and they're gone, he thought, dipping the jar Achilles-like into the pickle juice. It filled a little, but seeing shreds of vegetable matter, Taylor leaned further, scooping them into the jar. It was best to get as many ingredients as possible. Taylor swirled the juice around in hopes of corralling more of the brown stuff. There was what looked like the bulb of a small dark-rooted onion, and Taylor went after it like it was a prize. He had to get on his tiptoes, but he got it. Success, he whispered bringing the jar up so he could look at his find. It swirled and tumbled and somersaulted to reveal itself with such a startling clarity that Taylor forgot to breathe. Turning gracefully in the jar was a human eye. Slightly shriveled, the whites dyed the sickly green-yellow of pickle brine, and the roots deflated into black threads. Taylor dropped the jar into the vat, not thinking of retrieving it. He had to get to the sheriff. He'd thought to catch we sell pickles violating health codes, not hiding body parts. But as he descended the rickety stepladder, something like a shadow within the depths of the vat caught his eye. The shape rising and breaking the brine surface caused a vinegar eruption. It lay across the lip on its side like a newly beached well. The pickled thing had once been a man, an old one, his body had shrunk and wrinkled like a drowned thumb. The hands were curled up near its bearded chin. Within one eye was a thick garlic clove, brined the same yellow as the pickled thing's horrid teeth. Taylor took a moment to get the courage to examine the body, yet when he reached to touch it, the slick skin repulsed him and he took a step down instead. He needed to be away and far from we sell pickles, he thought. But the pickled thing wanted different. It snatched at Taylor's arm and tried to pull itself out. It exhaled in bursts, each word a sharp spell that splattered herbs and vegetable bits across Taylor's face. It cleared its throat by gurgles and coughs and slapped around until he felt Taylor. The pickled thing clutched Taylor's arms with an unreal strength. Its old mouth, gray-gummed and toothless, enveloped Taylor's hand. The leathery tongue wiggled all through Taylor's fingers. The pickled thing retched. Terrible! Terrible! They're goddamn terrible! It spat. Those are the worst damn pickles I ever tasted! You dumb little shit! My pecker spitting out of no good, no nothing like you is God's cruel joke, I tell you! Taylor shrieked and lost his footing. His hand, greased with spit, slid from the pickled thing's grasp. In his fall, Taylor caught the lip of the bat, but that only gave the pickled thing a chance to slap around and catch the councilman again. They ain't got no spice, it said, his wooden fingers digging into Taylor's forearm. They ain't got no snap. They're all soft and pudgy like a fat lady's fingers. The pickled thing couldn't hold Taylor and he fell flat with a loud thump. One of the pickled thing's hands and most of its other arm were locked onto Taylor's sleeve and wouldn't let go. 
The bones popped from their sockets, and the soggy flesh tore like cheesecloth. Yet the pickled thing still clung onto the lip of the container, the juice churning from his wild kicking. There ain't much left in this jar but me and the recipe, you lout. And I ain't ever writing it down. Not now. Not never. It rambled, yammering vaguely about recipes and whore sons and his dill spiced legacy. They promised me sons for my pickles and gave me nothing but bums. Bums! I swear by this brine. Taylor didn't stay to hear the rest. He limped, fast as his portly body allowed, through the cellar hall and to the foot of the steps, all the time looking behind him and fearing that the pickled thing had gotten out of his container and crawled on its belly after him. But the pickled thing was content howling in its vat. Sighing, Taylor took the first step up the stairs, but stopped. Peepaw Pickle and his grandson stood at the top of the stairs. Ah, well, Fritz the old man said. Looks like we've got ourselves a real dilly of a pickle, don't we? Sure do, Peepaw. We sure do. Five. And that's why you're going down there and cleaning his tank, Peepaw said, loading a heavy box into the back of his truck. Glum-faced, Fritz crossed the sidewalk into the store and got another box from a tall stack. When he returned, he handed Peepaw the box, saying, He doesn't like me, and he's weird. Watch it, boy, Peepaw snapped. Eh, that's my great-great-grand Peepaw, and no shit he's weird. He's two hundred years old, and being blind and pickled ain't doing his brains any favors. Eh, so you go down there and treat him with respect. Uh, he's fed us for generations. I don't know why I have to... Because it's your fault, Peepaw said. You're always out back smoking your stuff. And don't think I don't smell it on account of the pickles neither, because I do. Fritz groaned, beginning an excuse, and a box slipped from his grasp. It hit the sidewalk and the glass inside clinked together. Both heard a muffled crunch. Peepaw sighed. And you wonder why you annoy the man. Ah, he spends his day in a jar and gets to come out to a careless no good. Fritz crouched and prodded the box with his fist. I think it's okay. Peepaw was struck dumb. You think? You what? Go ahead and pick it up then. Eh? Go on. Fritz lifted the box, its contents crunched and clinked, and took it over to Peepaw. The old man cut the tape seal with a pocket knife. He opened it, showing the contents to Fritz, and said, They look okay? The late evening painted everything in shadow, but the contents were undeniable. A jar filled with garlic and dill and peppers broken. Pickles strewn all over, though not in enough abundance to hide the pieces of Taylor. A plump hand, an ear, an eye, and tongue. I swear, Peepaw said. Drop another, and I'll put you in the vat to keep him company. You... Y'all ain't usually open this late, a voice called. Trouble with the help? Peepaw and Fritz turned. Sheriff Lieben shut his cruiser door and walked up to them. Raising his hand to acknowledge the lawman, Peepaw chuckled and said, I think I'm madder at myself for expecting more out of a lousy teenager. Don't be too hard on him, the sheriff said, shaking Peepaw's hand. Then he saw the leaking box in Fritz's arms. Oh, wasting good pickles, huh? The sheriff shook his head. That's a hanging offense in Dodd, son. The sheriff smiled. But... For a box of pickles, he pointed to a stack near the door. I'm sure I can look the other way. Hey, you don't want them pickles, Peepaw said. The boy here put water in the brine instead of vinegar and ruined enough product to have him as a slave laborer until he's a man. Peepaw snapped his fingers. 
Get the sheriff four of the garlic and four of the... The missus likes okra, right? The sheriff nodded. Four of the okra! Mild? You know she's got the ulcer. Mild! Peepaw concluded, waving Fritz away. Peepaw and the sheriff spoke about the heat while Fritz filled the box with jars of pickles and okra. The sheriff didn't take a step before opening the box and retrieving the jar. He selected a small pickle and ate it in two bites. In a satisfied daze, the sheriff got in his cruiser and left. He waved to them with another pickle in his hand. Peepaw and Fritz waved back until the sheriff was gone. Hurry up with those boxes, Peepaw told him. Eh, break another and you'll be cleaning the tank with your toothbrush. <laughs> And that was We Sell Pickles by Mario E. Martinez. A good reminder that they don't call them secret recipes for nothing. A little about the author. Mario E. Martinez writes weird stories in South Texas, Giggity, where he lives and teaches. He has written novels, Ash Tree and Neo Laredo, and two short story collections, San Casimiro, Texas, and The Pig Name Orinius, and other strange tales. You can find his work at www.marioemartinez.com. Thanks, Mario. Love the story, man. For our next story tonight, we're putting down the pickles and picking up an alien blaster. Time to clean the palate with a little sci-fi. So, from author Gray Walker, I give you Project Morpheus. The rhythmic sound of Isaac Carter's respirator was all he could hear when he stepped out of his shuttle's airlock. His destination was in front of him, the gray space station known as Morpheus 4. At its end was a large cylindrical structure, which he had to guess was some kind of satellite camera. As the thrusters on his suit activated, he propelled forward. He made a signal towards the cockpit of the shuttle, which proceeded to leave. The pilot would be back in three hours, sooner if Isaac requested a quick extraction. As he drifted toward the airlock, he held his ID up to the scanner. Recognizing him as military personnel, it flashed green and the door opened. He floated into the decompression chamber as the large door closed behind him. The artificial gravity then engaged and his feet hit the floor. A crackling noise came over the radio in his helmet. Zachary 20 to Loki 48. Radio check. Do you copy? Over. Said his partner, Kelly Monroe. Loki 48. Coming in clear, Valkyrie. Over. You were briefed on your assignment, I presume? Over. Affirmative, Valkyrie. Investigate the cause behind the radio silence from Morpheus 4 Research Station. Head to comms tower and contact the TYR Marines. Secure any personnel in research and neutralize possible threats. Over. He withdrew his assault rifle from his back, checking the ammunition as it folded out from its compact form. Copy, Loki 48. Send in map of the station now, over. A loading bar appeared on his visor, which read data received when it had finished loading. Sure enough, an entire map of Morpheus 4 uploaded to his suit's onboard computer. Copy, Valkyrie. Commence an operation now. Going dark, over. Understood. Valkyrie out. The communication shut off. It always sounded weird when Isaac compared Kelly's on-duty behavior to her off-duty behavior. She always sounded so cool-headed and professional when on duty, but off-duty she was always chipper and upbeat. She always had been since they were kids. Hell, she was like the big sister he never had. As such, both of them had been happy when she had achieved her childhood dream of being a Valkyrie. Isaac brushed those thoughts aside for now, opening the door in front of him. What greeted him was silence almost akin to the void outside. In front of him was a huge half-darkened lobby with the Gaia Inc. logo over the wall above the front desk. 
Said logo comprised of a half-formed earth and the slogan, Building Humanity's Path Back Home Since 2134. He had heard about the loss of earth. Nobody knew what had happened, what had caused earth to become uninhabitable. All he knew was that the people working on the so-called Project Morpheus was to help repopulate Earth. Bang up job they're doing, he thought sardonically. Something terrible had happened. Something that would jeopardize the project, possibly galactic security. The new Terra Council never would have sent someone from the Loki unit if it was anything else. As Isaac stepped through the lobby, his boots hardly making a noise. He did a double take as he caught a glimpse of a nearby vent. Something was dripping from it. Taking a few steps closer, he scanned the strangely colored substance. As expected, it was blood, but not human blood, not anymore. No matches came up for the origin, but this fluid seemed to overwrite the genetic code of whoever the blood belonged to. This wasn't a mutation or anything accidental. No, whatever this was, it had assimilated the poor bastard's very DNA. That was when Isaac began to get afraid. He was already unnerved by the silence, but now? Now he knew that there was something on this station. He then spied a small blood-stained hollow scroll. Picking it up, he connected it to his suit to isolate the sound to the inside of his helmet, then played the latest recording. He almost jumped as the sounds of Bedlam greeted him. Screams, gunfire, and the sounds of distorted voices snarling and speaking bizarre words and phrases were what permeated the audio. Then a man's voice began speaking rapidly. This is Ryan Teague, Morpheus Force Security. If you're listening to this, get the hell off this station while you can. If this is anyone in the military or from the corporation, tell the higher-ups that the project is a complete failure. Scuttle the station. I say again, scuttle Morpheus 4 before these things can escape. They want to. Oh, shit. No, no! The recording was cut off as it dissolved into a ghastly two-toned screech followed by the sound of ripping flesh. Now Isaac was on full alert. He switched the safety off on his assault rifle before carefully making his way through the lobby and into a short hallway which led into a small unlit room with two more hallways on each side. Based on what the map said, his destination was down to the left. Switching on the light attached to his rifle, he began to do a sweep of the room, then did another double take. Slowly he refocused the light, only for it to illuminate a tall, grotesque being. Its general outline was humanoid, but its skin seemed to be made of a rippling silver liquid like mercury. Its face was almost human, but it possessed glowing purple eyes and razor-sharp teeth that extended from its gums. It stood over the body of a man clad in blue security armor, his skin showing signs of desiccation and his face frozen in a look of abject terror. The creature's fingers had transformed into odd tendrils that seemed to have drained him of his vital fluids. It then looked up at Isaac, who stood frozen for a different reason. The shock of what he was seeing rooted him to the spot. It wheezed and panted, then spoke in a two-toned voice similar to what he had heard on the hollow scroll. The creature said, Soldier! Its voice betrayed no emotion merely expressing an observation. It stood taking in shallow breaths as it regarded him. <laughs> then it screeched and charged at him without warning. Reacting in shock and fear, he let off eight rounds from his assault rifle, all of which hit the creature point blank, but not before it had reached him and swapped across his chest. It didn't pierce the armor, though, as it was on the ground before it could build the proper momentum. It shrieked and thrashed on the floor before being silenced by Isaac, removing his sidearm and firing at its form. Taking some time to calm himself down, he repeated in his head, Four, inhale. Four, exhale. Once he calmed down sufficiently, he scanned it. 
He noted that its blood consisted both of the poor humans that was on the ground and of the strange purple fluid he found in the lobby. With some reluctance, he continued down the hallway. It was clear that the possibility of survivors was moot. First and foremost, the Loki unit's specialty was black ops, and that was why he had his doubts about the assignment. They were never sent into an area in tactical gear that contained live civilians. So what was so important that they needed someone as cold and pragmatic as a Loki? Why not send the TYR Marines outright? Isaac brushed his thought aside and continued along the hallway indicated by the HUD's map. He could feel eyes on him. He knew that what he had just encountered couldn't have been the only of its kind, and for that reason he kept his rifle trained ahead. It took about a half hour to slowly creep down the hallway. He had needed to run. He could have cleared it in minutes, but stealth was a factor right now. A skittering came from the nearby vent. He whipped his head in that direction, then heard it on the opposite wall. Keeping his eyes open, he watched for any sudden movements, anything to suggest an ambush. Despite his vigilance, he was still surprised by his follower revealing itself. Lunging out of the vent and landing on the floor in front of him was a smaller creature that seemed to combine aspects of a human and a spider. It had a mostly human face, eight purple humanoid eyes, and crawled on eight arachnid legs, each of which had a small humanoid hand at the end. Before he could react, it was on him with a screech, latching onto his armor with impressive strength. Isaac could feel the claws of this monster's hands as its face revealed a mouth that had human teeth and a spider's fangs. Venom dripped from its mouth as it leaned forward. In desperation, he ran at the sterile white wall, slamming the creature into it with a sickening crunch. Letting out a brief squeal, it released him, falling on its back before he brought his boot down on it again and again, until little remained of it besides a flattened body and glowing purple blood. Panting, he felt a slight sting on his side. From the looks of it, the creature had been able to leave a mark on him, but his suit didn't detect any venom in the wound. The HUD only saying, puncture detected, administer medical nano machines immediately. Removing the syringe from his tactical pouch, he injected the fluid near the wound, allowing the small robots to slowly close it. While they worked, he repaired the damage done to his suit using a gel containing similar machines. When he was finished, he continued down the hall, eventually reaching a door with the words Testing Center, Authorized Personnel Only. He cautiously opened the door and was about to activate his light, but as it turned out, he didn't need to. The laboratory was a large room, not quite as expansive as the lobby, but with enough space to hold at least 30 researchers. A strange purple light bathed the room in its unnatural glow illuminating the horrors beneath it. There were numerous creatures, some of which were like the first, others like the arachnid, but many more were odd, disgusting combinations of different animal parts. One had two heads, one of which was a large reptilian and the other a human. Others seemed to have animal heads where normally they would have been arms. There were more configurations, but with each new creature, Isaac felt he would vomit. As he looked up, though, he wished that the monsters had been the worst part. All over the walls and obscuring the ceiling was a strange material that reminded him of a spider's web. Unlike a normal web, though, this one was glowing, pulsing with the same purple light filling the room. Entangled in the webs were people, probably most of the scientists working on the station. Flowing from their bodies was a strange purple energy. This energy was absorbed by small round objects that reminded him of egg sacs. As if to confirm this, one burst open, revealing a small humanoid creature similar to the first one he had killed. It saw him, then let out a shriek. All of its brethren turned their glowing eyes at him and proceeded to let out cries of aggression. The situation escalated from there. 
Letting off more rounds into the monsters, he killed five, stomping on their heads for good measure. Another one of the spiders suddenly leapt onto his back and clawed into him. Letting out a cry of pain, he took on a similar strategy as with the first, ramming it against the wall. It took two more minutes of shooting, kicking, punching, and stomping, as well as destroying the sacks, but eventually, all of the creatures in the room lay dead in pools of purple blood. Taking time to heal himself and patch up the suit, he was about to walk into the comms, which lay just across the room. Then he heard a woman's raspy voice from the wall. Please, come here. Scanning the source of the voice, he found her identification to come up as Dr. Rachel Bachman. In his briefing, Isaac had been told that she was the one in charge of the project. As such, she was a high-priority extraction target, or fell in that, the research she had done. As he approached her, she extended an arm. In her shaken hand was a hollow scroll. All the data you need is on there. But play the last recording and follow the instructions quickly. Go into the comms room. Then when you finish, get off the station quickly. Please undo it. Undo. Undo. Isaac had just enough time to grab the hollow scroll as her arm went limp. To say he was confused was an understatement. Nonetheless, he plugged his suit's HUD into the device, anticipating more sounds of chaos. Instead, there was a video file of the same woman with several other files labeled differently. He selected the video. Dr. Bachman was surrounded by her colleagues, who were all running about, checking various devices and equipment, some even apprehensively grasping firearms. She looked tired, her hair messy and her eyes red, though whether from insomnia or from tears, he wasn't sure. Hello. She greeted the interviewer, her voice melancholy. My name is Dr. Rachel Bachman. I'm the head of Project Morpheus. We were sent here ostensibly to observe the Earth and to see if it could be repopulated. Our true reasons were to study these. A hologram of one of the creatures appeared beside her. We have come to know these creatures as Draugr. They are the creations of something much greater. Something strong enough to cause the event we have since called Ragnarok. A still image of the infamous pit which had supposedly resulted in Earth's population dying out flashed next to her. This version was different, however. Tendrils of familiar purple light shimmered from it seeming to reach for the station and separating into numerous vein-like offshoots. In that pit lives the Jormungandr. This is the closest image I can show, but I will tell you what you need to know about it to the best of my ability. It possesses vast telepathic abilities, which are shown by the purple energy. You can't see it with the naked eye unless viewed through our equipment or exposed to the creature. It made the Draugr. Well, perhaps made is the wrong word. During Ragnarok, it took any creature living on Earth, including humans, and assimilated them into itself. After that, it began combining them. We don't know why, but our studies have suggested that it isn't content to merely tear apart and reconstruct organisms. It wants to create life of its own. To that end, the Jormungandr began assimilating the genetic code of the aforementioned creatures, hoping to gain a better understanding of how to create something. Its grasp of scientific knowledge was rudimentary at best before we came here. Because of us, it's becoming more knowledgeable learning how to combine more efficiently and producing organisms that live longer. It wants to recreate us in its image. After that, we have reason to assume that it will hunt down the colonies of humans, then assimilate them as well, or 
Perhaps just annihilate them. We still aren't certain. A trickle of blood ran from her left nostril. Then she winced and clutched her head. I, I need to speak quicker. I've been able to block it out, but it's becoming more persistent. The Trogger have broken containment on the station and have begun taking the genetic material of the humans and other creatures on board. The Jormungandr wants to spread its influence using them, using us. In the comms room, there is a console that will activate a secret component of the station. One we've been able to develop after studying the Jormungandr for long enough. A diagram of the said console and the component appeared beside her. We had it imported from a discontinued planet mining station. It was discontinued because of its unfailing tendency to irreparably damage the planet it was fired upon. We call it the Milner. With the proper tests and modifications, we've been able to make it strong enough to... Here, tears began running from her eyes as she resumed talking. It's strong enough to harm the Jormungandr, but that isn't enough. Life on Earth is still present. The two exist symbiotically. Simply put, you need to destroy life on Earth. I know this seems mad to you, and it is. I hate this as much as you do, stranger, but whoever you are, this is the only way to ensure that the Jormungandr's power is kept in check. There's no guarantee of it dying, but the Draugr will die, and more importantly, we on the station will. The entire team is in agreement. We cannot be allowed off the station alive. But we can't activate it. The Jormungandr won't let us. You aren't its thrall. You haven't been exposed to it long enough. I'm sorry to force this on you. More than that, though, I'm sorry I ever began this project. If you happen to see my family, tell them. Here she stifled a sob, then continued in a broken voice. Tell them the truth, and that I love them. Good luck. Just before the recording ended, the door burst open, and the sounds of the drogger rang out, along with the sounds of gunshots. Isaac stood for a moment, processing all this information. He looked towards the open door, heading for the comms room. Walking towards it, his rifle still aimed ahead, he tried to concentrate on the mission. Once he reached the room, however, he felt it, heard it. He felt thoughts that weren't his own running through his brain as he found the console she had mentioned. Sure enough, he recognized it as a mining cannon interface. They had been developed for the layperson to operate due to the interchangeable nature of mining jobs. He paused before he could activate it. Was he really going to go through with this? He was trained in the ways of unconventional warfare, guerrilla tactics, infiltration of crime syndicates and terrorist cells, murder. The Loki unit specialized in all of these and more, but this was far out of his league. He was told to destroy the earth, the cradle of humankind, he then remembered what he had been taught during his training. He was told that he would be called upon to do things that would make him sick, things that no decent human being could ever do with a clear conscience. He was taught that no matter what, he had to keep humanity in mind. Ragnarok had forced humans to rebuild civilization all over again on new planets, make first contact with intelligent alien life the hard way, and engage in three civil wars during the first 30 years. If it hadn't been for Ragnarok, the Lokis wouldn't exist, nor would they be needed. And now he was discovering that Ragnarok had not been some freak of nature, that something living, something intelligent had caused it, and it was planning to finish what it started. Four. 
before. His mind was made up. Humanity had endured its near extinction, and he wouldn't let that be in vain. He activated the console and was met with the pit. Suddenly millions of purple lights shone from it. No, he realized, horror forming a knot in his stomach. Their eyes. As the eyes shone brightly back at their new voyeur, the light from them revealed the beast itself. Jormungandr was the world serpent according to Norse mythology. This, however, bore no resemblance to a serpent. It didn't resemble anything that Isaac had a frame of reference for. Natural laws didn't seem to apply to it. It moved in ways that Isaac dared not try to make sense of, lest he drive himself mad. Then it spoke, and he recognized it as the voice of the intrusive thoughts he had felt and heard when he entered. Seeming to grip his mind, spoke of being older than the earth, that the earth had been built for it. It hadn't been built as a home though, but as a prison, a cage. Who had built the cage, the Jormungandr didn't say, only referring to them as they in a hateful, venomous tone. It then began to coaxingly speak to Isaac. It told him that it hadn't intended to begin Ragnarok, but that it was willing to make amends by allowing humankind to join it, to become one with it. No more would there be any conflict, any hate. Isaac began to respond mentally, agreeing with it. Sounding pleased with his reply, it told him to contact the Marines per his original instructions. It guided him to walk to the communication equipment. Then it released his mind. The instant it did this, he connected to the console, sending an emergency code to his pilot. The voice returned, sounding puzzled, then horrified and angry as he ran back to the cannon console. Placing the target in reticle over the massive eyes, he hit the button on the screen that would fire it. Sure enough, a long energy beam shot out from the device he had mistaken for a camera. Pain. Pain lanced through his head as he felt both the creature being impacted by the cannon and hearing its agonized shrieks. It was all he could do to gather himself up and begin to sprint back the way he had come, feeling the voice of the Jormungandr growing quieter and weaker. The station's machinery began sparking and exploding as the cannon had overloaded them. More Draugr, in a pain desperate frenzy, tried to stop him, but he just gunned them down. It took much quicker to leave the station than it did to enter due to his stealthy approach. Eventually, he found himself back in the lobby, where he quickly opened the door just as more Draugr charged at him. He closed it once inside the decompression chamber, then opened the airlock door. Sure enough, the shuttle was there, waiting for him. He propelled himself toward the entrance to the vessel, then collapsed once inside. Breathing heavily, he slowly got up, sat in a chair and gazed at the station. As the shuttle departed, he watched as it began to dissolve into a ball of metal and flames. Then he looked past it. Slowly, the flame was spreading across the earth from the pit, looking almost like some kind of flower opening. The irony didn't escape him. He leaned back, sighing heavily. Short as this op had been, this was hands down the most stressful. He looked at the hollow scroll in his hand, then tucked it away in his tactical pouch. No doubt the new Terra Council would want to hear about this. He had just annihilated Earth, rendering it truly uninhabitable. He might be excommunicated from the Lokis, possibly executed for all he knew. He didn't care. Even as he heard the withered, faint voice in his head cursing his name, he knew he had made the best decision under the circumstances. The Jormungandr was still alive, but now it could never gain the power it had wanted. One problem remained, however. The Jormungandr had spoken of beings that had imprisoned it. 
as he gazed out at the void of space. He wondered where those creatures were now. And that was Project Morpheus by author Gray Walker. A good reminder that it's about time to revisit the Elder Scrolls. Or maybe Mass Effect. Well, damn it, maybe both. A little about the author. Gray Walker is an aspiring writer from Alabama, currently working on an M.A. in creative writing. His favorite genres are sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, a la Stephen King, Frank Herbert, and Isaac Asimov. You can read more from Gray at his WordPress page, thegraywalker.wordpress.com. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. Fuck you, Jeff. So grab a drink for the road, friend. Maybe a pickleback if you're still in the mood for it. And to all the people out there who support and listen to this show, I love you all. So may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. And park wherever the hell you want. If anyone hassles you, tell them Drew said to go fuck themselves. (laughs) Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.